Welcome to Through the Trauma Podcast. My name is Amber Larkins, published photographer, storytelling expert, visual artist, entrepreneur, speaker, and coach. This podcast was born from one question. How do I get inspiring stories of triumph out to the people who need to hear them the most? Come with me, enter my world, where lives are getting changed, heroes are getting developed, and greatness is being achieved. All right, I want to welcome you to Through the Trauma podcast. Today we have a very exciting guest that I am excited to introduce you guys to. I have with me today Patrick Thrasher. (laughs) I knew I was going to mess that up, but um, he is a fellow podcaster. We actually met through our podcasting um, medium and uh, online, and he has an amazing story. He is a boxer, martial arts. We have a lot in common as far as fitness goes. Uh, but I, what I love about him and his podcast, which is Let's Talk with Patrick, is he discusses real issues and his heart is bent on truly giving back to the community. And I just love that. So Patrick, thank you for joining us today. I really appreciate having you here. Thank you very much for the invitation. I appreciate it. How are you doing today? Um, it's a, it's a good day to do an interview. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, happy Sunday. I, I just got done doing yoga and, um, it just helped keep me centered. You know what I mean? Cause life has been truly, um, you know, kind of crazy in my end, even since, since I was a child until adulthood for sure. Cause like I went through a lot of things and, um, I use this motivation to keep me going. You have a story that has multiple parts, multiple different Absolutely. things that has happened um, do you want to get into it? And then we can get into a little bit later, kind of where that's oh. taking you and what you're doing now. Absolutely. I, I kind of want to talk about why I did my podcast, by the way, too. Um, cause it yeah. relates to that. So, um, you know, my podcast called let's talk with Patrick podcast. And, um, I basically did that just because I had a back injury and I was just stuck in the house, depressed. And I started thinking about my life, like the things that I went through and, um, you know, um, trauma is something else. Like I, I think n- none of us go and escape from it. We all deal with some kind of trauma. And I feel like, you know, I have a, a ability to connect with different people from all walks of life, no matter what their background is, I can conversate with them. And, um, you know, like I said, when I, um, I don't know, I, I feel like as, as men, we should be able to have a safe space, be able to talk about real things. Cause a lot of times we don't get to express ourselves. We are taught from a young age that, you know, men don't cry, men don't say this, men don't say that. We just get up and, and keep going. And I feel like that's not a healthy thing at all because, um, mm-hmm. you know, suicide rates are so high for men. It's, it's extremely high, especially guys in the military. It's super high. And I even felt suicidal myself, especially um, when my brother passed away back in 08 because I was going to art school. I had dropped out at the time. I, I dropped out like in March 08. And um, so hold on, let me go back. OK, so th- th- when I saw my brother, it was back in Christmas of 07 and his energy was so weird. and him and I was now 20s at the time. I didn't have the, I guess, the mental capacity to even ask what was going on with him. I just thought he was just being weird and acting funny. I had no idea he was dealing with so many different things because uh, one of the pictures that my sister took when we looked back at it, you could just tell something's on his mind. Like, he just looked very depressed. Like, he just had so much going on. And then I seen, hold on, then um, let me see. So his birthday was uh, June the 29th, and he passed on July 2nd uh, from suicide. So I didn't know that until the following morning when I had to go to work. Um, so it was like six in the morning. I had to go to work at eight. I was a supervisor at the time. And um, I, I heard this big knock on my door. Boom, boom, boom. And I said, what the world? So I got up. I looked, up, looked through the peephole. It's my sister. She's in tears. And I opened the door. I said, what's wrong with you? What's going on? She said, uh, Anthony is dead. I said, Anthony who? Because I thought about it was our dad. She said, our brother. And I said, our brother? I said, what are you talking about? I said, just come on in. So she came on in. And um, she was just bawling her, her eyes out and I gave her a hug and I was trying to process it because I didn't cry yet. I was just like, just trying to figure out, is is this real? Like, are you joking with me or what? So after that, she left and I laid back in bed for a little bit. My friend named Figaro, well, his, his real name is Ralph, but he, he's deceased. He's been dead for a while, too. He called me. He's like, man, you know, I heard about your brother. I'm so sorry to hear that. And I was like, I said, so this is a real like situation. He said, yeah. I was like, dang. So. 
to make a long story short, I went to work and um, I told my manager, I said, look, man, my brother died last night. I don't know if I could be able to work the whole shift. I said, I will try. And so he said, cool, that's understandable because I'm sorry to hear that. So I went, I started working and um, I had a customer who was really irate because one of the cookies wasn't done. It was because I worked for a cookie company at the time. I was supervisor and the cookie was not, it, it wasn't cooled down yet. We just took out the oven. So it wasn't ready to be displayed yet. And this lady just went off of me, just started like going ballistic. And I just, I was in my emotions at that time. And I went off on her and I told her, I said, look, man, I'm saying my, my brother died last night and blah, 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 blah. And then she just looked like real, like shocked and just like, whoa, she said, I'm so sorry. And I said, yeah, you should be. You got to be careful what you say to people. You never know what people are dealing with. And she just kept apologizing. And at that point, I was just, I said, no, just hear your cookie. Just keep moving. And so anyway, um, I told my, my manager, I said, look, man, I, I got to go. I said, I can't even emotionally i just can't do this because i'm i'm about to start crying and i'm just angry and, and just confused right now and um so i end up going home which is outside of Ath- i mean outside of atlanta is in athens my, where my mother lived at and i went to her house she had like this big reef on the door and i said you know what? i said he really is dead you know what i mean it's, it's not her it's not her son that's my father's son but she loved him like that was her son and um so i went in the house and Everybody was all emotional and it was just such a weird thing. It still didn't really, like, really, really hit me yet until I went to the store and I bought my brother an actual uh, shirt to wear for the funeral, for, you know, for the casket. And um, so, anyway, we, we know going to the funeral home and I saw the body and that's when I just broke down. I just really broke down and I started to become more withdrawn and I kind of just stayed to myself a lot. And I was kind of upset too because um, some of the churches, we was trying to get them to to host the funeral and they wouldn't do it just because he died from suicide. So we felt a little slighted about that. And my mother's friend named Dale Sanders, she's a pastor. She ended up doing the funeral service for us, but for my brother. And so anyway, um, like I said, after the funeral, it's such a blur now because it was just so much going on, so much drama that was happening at that time. But uh, after that, you know how you, you are left with your thoughts. You're at home by yourself, like, calls start stop coming in and um i started to like self-destruct a little bit like not caring about paying my bills not going to work as much feeling very suicidal very angry not being as friendly at all and it took let me see because at that time i started to um i got that's when i got back into um boxing mma at that time actually yep and i started to uh you know get myself together but then the recession was right around the corner so i ended up losing my job lost my apartment so, so I had all these things going on trying to figure out where I'm going to live. And I ended up moving in with my oldest brother and he had a friend that moved in with us. So he had three grown men with no job. And that was such a struggle as well. And the, the tension was so thick. And so I had a buddy of mine, his name Ali, he's, he's Muslim. Um, he had a, a antique shop and he told me, he said, Hey Pat, you, you should work for me. Let's put some money in your pocket. It's under table money. I can't really pay you a whole lot, but I can pay you something so you can have something to eat at least. So, I ended up doing that for, i say about a month or whatever. And um, that was pretty hard just because business started to dry up. He couldn't afford to pay me as much because I'm driving way from, um, I, I was living in Gwinnett County. So I'm driving from Gwinnett County to um, El- Fulton County in Atlanta. And what well, is in Buckhead actually. And um, it just, I don't know. So we ended up going to all these like mansions to pick up all these old antiques to, to uh, revamp it. And I can't lie, at that time, I was super broke. I was hungry. I was trying to work out. I was still depressed about my brother. I, I really haven't, like, super, really processed what had happened. And I started to get all these bad thoughts about, like, robbing people just because I was hungry and I was angry, you know? And, but luckily, I didn't do that. But I had those thoughts in my mind just because of my situation. I, financially, I just, I was just in a bad spot. And um, so, to make a long story short, Ali ended up selling his business because the money was just, it was just drying up. It wasn't a good business. So he ended up moving to Miami. He was like, Pat, I don't know what you, I don't know what you want to do, but you need to figure something out. You need to go back to school or do something. So I said, okay. So I, I ended up putting all my jewelry in, which I did not want to, but I put my rings, my bracelets, my necklace. I got my cell phone cut back on. And that's when I started applying for jobs. And I ended up getting a job at Sam's. So I started working for them and my car got stolen at work 
yeah, it's my, I had a cut. It got stolen at work. And I was really upset about that. Oh, Lord. And um, I ended up meeting this woman. She's a yoga instructor. And she started to talk to me a lot. And I came to her class. I started to, you know, feel more at peace about things. I ended up getting another car from my mother. My mother had a, a Buick. So I, I started having, you know, transportation again, which was great. And, um, yeah, I, I got back in school. I graduated doing IT, which, you know, I'm not using it right now, obviously. But that's what I graduated doing. And so I ended up moving to Colorado after a while. I moved in, moved for a woman. I was dating at the time. And so anyway, um, i say about 2014, because that was 2012 when I moved. So 2014, I had another tragedy that happened. Okay, so that summer, I, I went to see my sister. She had, a, you know, had her first son, and we were celebrating out and happy and everything. So a few months after that, that October, my cousin Darla, she got murdered. She was murdered by her ex-boyfriend. And, um, yeah, he he shot her multiple times, and then he put her in the trunk of her car and set it on fire. Like, he he, he has to drop the car off by her mother's house and set it on fire. And um, that was such a, a tragedy as well, because, um, I, I I mean, I was bawling really hard about that. It was because she was like a little sister to me. And um, it was like a movie, because uh, what happened, he went over to my aunt's house, because my cousin was missing for a couple of days at the time. So nobody knew she was dead yet, but they, well, let me see. So the, the charred car was found and people suspect it was him that did it. So he ended up going to my aunt's house and pretending like he was trying to, you know, look for my cousin. He was like, I don't know where she's at, but uh, hopefully we can find, you know, that she's safe or whatever. And anyways, a, a woman that was there recognized him. She called the police, the police ended up arresting him. And yeah, so it, it, yeah, it, it was just a, a lot going on at that time. And, um, I was going through a lot of different things in my home life and, and work stuff and just trying to keep it all together. Cause I've been so used to not crying and just, um, you know, you know how men are, we don't really talk about our feelings. It just, um, yeah. (laughs) Why do you, why do you think that is? Why do you think, I mean, I had another guest that talked about that and had a big heart for sharing you know, that it's okay for men to step out. And I agree. I think it's totally, I think it's great. Um, mm-hmm. But but why do you think there's that stigma in society, not for men not to share their emotions? I, I think it's just something that's ingrained. I mean, it's been like that for, for centuries. You know what I mean? Like men are looked at as strong and, and breadwinners and and women are looked at more as, as I, should I say fragile, I guess? Yeah, more emotional. emotional, I suppose. Yeah, mm-hmm. more emotional. Yeah, so that that's the thing. I think that's what, but it's not healthy because all of us are human. Like we all have emotions, we all have tears. We are designed to express ourselves if we have to. And um, yeah, so I, I think that's not a yeah. I, it's it's good the fact we are talking about these things because I think people need to see that it's okay for us to express ourselves because mm-hmm. we are human. Mm-hmm. What do you think? What do you think? I mean, obviously you and I both have a heart for sharing things. We're both doing a podcast. We're both sharing stories. So it's, we both feel like it's a good idea for people to share their stories and get things out into the open. But is there anything else that you can think of that you think would be a good thing for people to do to be able to kind of get rid of that stigma, especially among men? And, and among young boys, I I have a son. So, you know, it's something I think about. Yeah. Um, I think, I think just having more conversations, like ha- being more open-minded that I think that's the, the, the way to go. Um, I don't know if that, that's the one all be all, but I do think that's a, a step, a start at least to, um, just have conversations and, and show men actually have a conversation. Cause I had a, um, episode that I did with the guy, a, a friend of mine, he's a life coach. I haven't posted that part yet, but he actually broke down and cried, and I gave him a hug because it was like a, some real serious stuff that happened in his in his life with his with his daughter and his ex wife, and um, cause the the ex I mean yeah the ex boyfriend was trying to kill them actually, and he he missed of course because he was shooting at them he missed and he ended up turning the gun on himself in front of you know the ex wife whatnot so his uh, daughter was contemplating suicide and he just broke down, and um, like I said I, I gave him a hug and I want to show people I said it's okay for guys to give each other a hug. There's nothing suspect, anything about that. You know what I mean? Cause like all of us have emotion. <laughs> like I said earlier, we do. And um, I think once people see that, I think some people will feel more comfortable to have those 
um, conversations and, and those intimate moments, which is like, there's nothing wrong with that. I'm learning to do that. Cause when I was younger, I didn't give guys a hug at all. I thought there was something wrong with it. Me and my father didn't give each other a hug until like, when I say when I was much older, for sure. Cause I felt weird about it, you know? Cause even though he, me and my father, my father and I, we, we definitely bump heads a lot. Rest in, rest in peace to him. We, we definitely bump, bump heads a lot, but I definitely, you know, gave him a hug at times as well. I agree with you with the hugging is it's, such a big part of just empathy you know like hey I I, there's no words for what you're going through but let me hug you let me embrace you let me show you that it's okay and I'm here for you it's a universal language touch right right I I also think too um I think if you start molding kids when they're younger to accept people um expressing themselves I think they can help because sometimes with grown with older people they're, they're kind of hard to mold. You know what I mean? People get stuck in their ways, but at least with the young the younger kids that's coming up, you can kind of mold them in a certain way to where they can accept that people have to express themselves. Because I think it's very important. When you look at the, the gun violence that, that's been happening for a long time, a lot of the time, those guys, they lack a lot of love. They, they want somebody to say, look, I love you. I care about you. Um, you you're important. You matter. They, they want that. They all looking for something. People want a sense of belonging, for sure, and, and not be judged as well. Because like I said, when I was younger, I definitely had those moments where I felt a certain way as well. But luckily, I had a mother. She, you know, she was full of love. You know what I mean? She was a, um, a God-fearing woman. Um, she was, she did like, a, she worked at a drug rehab center once upon a time. So she always, you know, cared for people as well. You know, so that definitely helped me to become more empathetic as well. But not, just not well, empathetic and sympathetic, if that makes sense. Yeah. Mm-hmm. for sure yeah so I think yeah so I think that's the way to go like just start them off young for sure I agree with you with the gun violence and the things that, when people lash out it's because they're in mm-hmm. they're in search of something they're missing something and you know as obviously like I'm one person you're one person we can't change the world but we can make a ripple effect in what sure. we do and I think being able to just go out you know I had this I had this thing happen when I, before I started embarking on my project, before I started embarking on this podcast or anything. And I was just like, I, there was, I have a story of my own and there's shame. It's covered in shame. And it's like, I didn't want to share that. And I felt God whisper to me, if, would you do it if it impacted one? And I was like, yeah, you know what? I would, because you never know if you impact one, how many people that person's going to go impact. And it's a domino effect. So it's like, what can we do as a community? We can set out to love people and love. If we love just one, that makes an impact. If we give one person a place to share, if we let one person know they're loved and cared for, that makes an impact. So I I just, I think your experiences, the things that you've gone through in your life and the loss and the grief, like that's, you're doing something now and you're transforming that into impact. You know, you're turning that, that hardship into power, your pain into power. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. It, it took some time, though, for sure. It took a lot of time. It took a lot of growth and a lot of um, self accountability. If that makes sense, mm-hmm. especially with the pandemic. I, the pandemic, I had so much like idle time to really reflect because I lost my mother right before the pandemic occurred. Like her, she died like a week after my birthday, actually. So this was three. This was three deaths. Three deaths within mm-hmm. what amount of time? Um. Okay. So my brother died in '08. My cousin, Darla, she, she was killed in 2014. My mother died in 2020, and my father died in 2020 as well. He died in September of 2020. Four deaths. Yeah, so but I had, I, had plenty more, I had plenty more deaths than that, but those, like, the, the main, like, I guess the significant. Well, no, I take that back. I had another one back in 96. That was a rough one. Um, I had a cousin named Keisha. She was 15 at the time. She was um, shot and killed. She was murdered at the time, and that that uh, broke me big time. And, and, and during, back in 96... Um, therapy was such a stigma, especially in the black community. It was a big stigma, big time. So I went for a little bit. It was this woman named Miss Bell. She was my counselor for a while. And, um, I went, but then I, I, I started to pull back just because I felt insecure and I felt like I was 
crazy because that's the way people made you feel that you're crazy because you're getting some help. You know what I'm saying? So that was devastating because um, I just saw my cousin like a week before that we saw her at the mall and they say, no, we see her in the casket. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like she, she's dead. She's gone just like that. And um, it was just a, such an unfortunate event. So, um, so, do, so from 96 to, I say around to 08 when my brother died, I didn't cry those years at all. Barely. Uh-uh. I told myself, I, I said, I would never cry like I did. And that's no. Mm-mm. And then I realized how unhealthy that was because instead of, um, instead of like crying, whatever, mine turned to anger. And that wasn't a good thing. So I had to do a lot of self-reflection and rectify a lot of things as well. So by the time my mother died, I, I learned from everything else that I did. I said, you know what? I'm going to do things differently. So I ended up getting to therapy again. I tried it for the second time. And at that point, when I did it, I didn't care what people think. You know what I mean? Because as a man, I was so secure within myself and my skin. I said, you know, I don't, I don't care. I need to get myself some help. If I can help myself physically and mentally, I need to do, do something for myself spiritually as well. So um, I did therapy for a little bit. I did like maybe six classes. Well, not six classes, but six um, sessions. And the pandemic occurred. It was like, hey, uh, you you can do a video call if you want. And I said, you know what? No, <laughs> if I can't be there in person, I'm not doing it at all. And I stopped going. So I sink into depression. I start feeling suicidal. I start gaining weight because I'm eating like horribly. And then um, my job, I work for a college. We didn't work as much. So I'm at home and me and my ex-girlfriend, we was we had just broke up right before my mother died. So, but we was roommates. So that was kind of awkward. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm sleeping on the couch. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> so uh, it was, it was a lot. So I had to, you know, dig deep in myself and think about the good memories of, of my mother to keep me going. So I started to slowly get myself out this shell. I started to um, eat, start trying to eat healthy, stop buying certain things. Cause I was eating ice cream sandwiches all day. I buy ice cream sandwiches. I buy, um, what, what, uh, car- caramel delights uh, from Kroger, or whatnot. I buy that, and I would eat the whole thing in one set, and I sure will. And I'm, I'm buying hamburgers and all kind of stuff. And I'm like, oh, so like I said, once I started to get myself back on track, by the time my father passed, I was better mentally. I, and I was still depressed, but I was I was much better mentally. You know what I mean? Because uh, it was just with him, I was able I, w- I was able to prepare for it more. Because my mother, that was abrupt. She was a diabetic. She ended up in a diabetic coma. Her blood sugar was was fifteen ninety eight, which was sky high. The normal rate supposed to be ninety to one twenty. That's the normal um, blood sugar rate. And um, so watching my mother die, that was just horrible. Like being in the hospital with her, that was just it was devastating. Because even the nurses, they cried. We gave them a hug. Me and my siblings, we gave the nurses a hug and and try to comfort them as well. Because they heard so many stories about my mother. And um, so anyway, so once my like I said, once my father passed. So I'm, I'm kind of jumping around, but once my father passed, mentally I was in a better mind state, way better than where I was. Mm-hmm. I was not as suicidal either. Like I, I, I wanted to live at that point when he died. What do you like? What would you tell someone if someone come to you and said, you know, like I've experienced loss and I'm in the middle of I don't see the purpose of life and I don't really see I'm I'm so deep in depression and I don't know how to get out of it. Would you tell them therapy? What what other tools or resources would you tell um, them to, to utilize? Well, with therapy, you have to make sure you find the right therapist, right? Because when, when my therapist mm-hmm. I had, she was great. I, I told, I asked, I said, I said, do you go to therapy? She said, yes. I make my my children go. I make my husband go. If you have a therapist that don't go to therapy, you need to find another one. I said, cool, makes sense to me. So it is that's that's definitely um a, a good tool if it's a good therapist because some therapists they're trying to make you you know take medicine it's like no i'm not i'm not trying to take medicine i don't want to get addicted to anything and also i think like having a good support like good good people good energy around you that makes a huge difference as well like luckily i had a few people in my corner that pretty much like kind of helped me get out of my rep you know what i mean and also i do have a fitness background so me going back into fitness that definitely gave me an outlet as well for sure But I also had to take time to reflect on things as well, hold myself accountable and also just really process what had just happened for sure. Instead of just blocking it, because for years, I just buried things. I just blocked things. And like I said, when my mom died, I felt like I was about to go crazy. For real. I did because everything that I thought I forgot about just came back. You know what I mean? And um, I just had to uh, face the music. You know what I mean? And um, it was, yeah, it was, it's devastating. It's very devastating, but I definitely recommend therapy. 
make sure it's the right therapist, um, working out, and also having a good support system. Make sure you have like good friends you can talk to who are non-judgmental. That's the biggest mm-hmm. thing is, is having the support for sure. Yeah, I think um, I know like there was a time and when I when I did therapy, it was a little bit different. I did therapy in my marriage. So like marriage counseling, and I can relate to what you're saying in that you have to find the right one because we went through several ones and with no help (laughs) whatsoever. Mm. And then finally found the right one. And, uh, I, I don't know how to tell people how to find the right one. I know a big issue for us at the time was that there was a lot of, um, financial constraints as far as like therapy goes. But uh, I actually have a friend and I'm trying to get him to come on the podcast because he works with the state of Tennessee. I know you're in Colorado, but he works in Tennessee and uh, has a lot of resources for those that can't afford therapy. So there are resources like that out there as well for people that can't afford it. Um, And I'm hoping that through sharing more and more, we can get more and more resources for people. But I agree with you 100%. Therapy is a big, it's it's huge because so many times we don't understand how our brain is processing things. And that's trauma. That's yeah. That's what happens when we, when we, we experience trauma. We don't, our brain is like, it's going into fight or flight. And it, processing that is hard. And sometimes we have to have someone to help us process those things. That's why therapy is so important. Let me ask you this. Why do you think therapy is such a big problem in the black community and especially among black men? (sighs) That's a good question. Um, I I just, I just think, like I said before, I think just the fact that um, with, with men, we're looked at as strong. We looked at as fierce and we looked at as, um, the, the breadwinner pretty much you know what I mean and I and it, it it's it's really hard to even have a, I don't even have one answer for that well regardless it is a it is that is definitely a stigma I mean I have so it my is. kids my kids are biracial so my my son is half okay. black and um so it's something that obviously concerns me um because I see in him that it's like a natural innate thing that he just shuts down like he, we have a hard time getting him to process and, you know, he's only 11, but I do think that this is something that needs to be talked about addressed. Yeah. Because it's, it's a, it's a problem. I'm not a man, so I can't relate to that. But um, I do think that you're right, that society puts pressure. It men wear the weight of, I have to be this, I have to be the provider. I have to be the strength. I have to be the leader. I have to be the person that like the front runner. And sometimes that's a lot. That's a heavy, that's a, that's a load to carry, you know? It Um, is. It's it's very stressful. Very stressful. That's that's why some people go ballistic because of that. They got too much pressure. They can't let it out. People too afraid about what people think about them. Right. It's it's this image that people trying to uphold. Yes. Ego. There's a level ego. of ego. Yes. Mm-hmm. We have a lot of that. Okay. Men in general, we have a whole <laughs> lot. I, I have an ego too. I do, <laughs> but I keep it in check. I do. Like as I, as I get older, I definitely try to keep myself in check and just be aware about if I'm acting a certain way. Mm-hmm. And that's why, like, I feel like, um, I think this is a great conversation because I think people should hear this and you know, it's okay. It, it's all right to, you know, talk about trauma and also, um, going through it because we all deal with things. Mm-hmm. None of us go in scathe at all. Well, and then there's this thing too, where you, I might have to lean on you one day and you might have to lean on me one day. And that's the beauty of human connection and fellowship is that, you know, when I'm strong, when I'm weak, someone else is strong for me. And when I'm strong, I can be that strength for someone else. I don't know if I said that right, but you know, the no, that makes sense. Make. I, I get it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I like get I it. think that's, that's the beauty of human connection. It's like, let's, let's lean on each other. Let's reach out to other people. 
Um, and let's get rid of these stigmas in societies that say that we can't, we're letting society define us. We're letting culture define us where it's like embrace that individualness, embrace the fact that we are all different. We all, you know, we're all go through different things. We all process things differently. One person can go through one type of trauma and never be affected and someone else can go through that type of trauma and it be life threatening, you know? So I just think it's something that what can we do, but talk more about it, share more about it and encourage more people to share. And by sharing our own stories and being vulnerable and authentic, I feel like that's where other people then get inspired to do the same. Absolutely. I, I want to say, I do feel like another thing, right? While I, I, at least for me, I didn't want to share certain things because I was afraid that people was going to take what I said and use it against me. Cause that, that does happen, but I'm at that point in my life. I don't even care. You know, I don't really care what people think it is what it is. It, these are my true feelings. That's what I went through. I can't change that. The only thing I could do is rectify and, you know, just be aware of how I respond to certain things. Just, just try to better myself. That's all. Cause at, at the end freedom. of the day, I just want peace. I want peace and tranquility. It is true. Exactly. It's true freedom. It is. Cause I think when you're so worried about what people think of society, think about you, especially when you're dealing with like real issues, that's a form of slavery to me, seriously. Mm -hmm. And once you're it able is. to unchain that, you feel so much better. You do. Yeah. And, and coming and to that's the where conclusion. I'm at right now. Yeah. And getting to the conclusion where you're, you realize I'm not for everybody and everybody's right. not for me. I want to connect with those that align well with me and I align well with them. And that's the beauty of human connection as well. Like that it's okay. You know, if things don't align, we just mm -hmm. go our separate ways and you go find someone you align with and I'll go find someone I align with. But we, <laughs> exactly. But coming to that. Yeah. Getting to that place where we're just like, I know I'm not for everybody. Some people are not, I'm not going to, they're not going to like my personality. They're not going to like who I am or how I look or what I, what I say or whatever. Then it takes that pressure off. You're like, well, then I don't have to, I know I'm not going to please everybody. Let me right, just be exactly. me. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, Embrace yeah. the I mean, individuality. It's, right. It's freedom, right? Yeah. And, and, and that's, yeah. Like I said, that's, that's something that we all learn. We learn that from experience. You know, when you go through so many different hardships, cause like I said, when I was coming up, my father, my father was a street dude. Like he, he was a, he was a painter and all that. Like he was a martial artist. He was very talented and a DJ, but he was a street dude. He used to be in jail a lot on and off a lot until mm -hmm. I was like maybe 14. And, um, so, you know, witnessing that, you know, and then also, you know, he, um, people shot at him before he'd been stabbed before. And, you know, he, he, he was always in, into all kinds of things. And, um, that type of things, like, kind of, I guess, helped mold me when I look back at things as well. Like, I'm, I'm just trying to better myself and, and just break the mold. So I have I have a question for you about that. Um, you okay. know, I don't know if you've heard heard it said that you're like the product of the five people you surround yourself with the most. Have you ever heard that? Absolutely. Yes. So what coming from a an environment where you've seen a lot of violence, if someone was listening today and For say sure. they've experienced this type of these types of loss, do you think possibly changing the environment they're in to the best of their ability. Sometimes it's, it's yeah. inevitable. If you're a child, you can't just move out of your house and change your family. I no. mean, you know, but can you, do you think that would make a difference in the lives of some people, especially if they're mm -hmm. in the middle of a place where it's like loss after loss after loss? Do you mm -hmm. think it makes a difference or no? Um, I, I think you have to have the will and want to change because some people get complacent. Mm -hmm. They know, they know things is messed up, but some people just content with, with the way things are, but you have to have that will and desire to want to change and, and make mm -hmm. a difference. I mean, me, me personally, um, like since I've been out in Colorado, it's just a different, different environment, different scene. Like the people out here are uh, really friendly and, um, I mean, people invite me to all kinds of things all the time and. I'm, I just meet some incredible people out here. You know, I don't have to look on my shoulder as much. It's just a different vibe out here. And because uh, when I go back home, I, I had to get back into that zone again. I got to, you know, look at everybody that come in the store. If I'm in, if I'm in a restaurant, I sit 
with my back against the wall. I'm, I'm watching everybody who's coming in, who's, who's leaving, just because you, you just never know at all. Mm-hmm. And I, I don't be around certain people no more either. You know what I mean? Cause some people, um, they're still, they still had it like the high school mentality and I evolved so much. I don't want to be around it. I just want to be around positive people, people who have goals and, and want to do better in life. Mm-hmm. That's, that's where I'm at right now. Period. Yeah. And I think as far as environment, that's that's a tough one environment. I don't I don't see the environment really changing itself. I mean, it, it's gonna take a lot of people to do that. Cause one person's not gonna be able to do it. They might change a couple of people, but change the whole environment, I don't see that happening. It's been so indoctrinated for like for so many decades. I just don't see that happening. It's not gonna be an overnight fix. And then plus it's just so many different layers to it. Like it's not even one solution. It's it's, it's gonna be a lot of different things to uh to help those issues. And um and also think about it when when people lose people, especially let's say if if I kill somebody or whatnot, uh, that family gonna want revenge eventually. And if, if they kill me, the the person who's related to me want to kill that person for killing me. It, 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 it just it's a cycle. Mm-hmm. It's it's okay. a, it's the same. It's a vicious cycle. It's, it's yeah. It's nothing new, but it's just it's very unfortunate. I've been watching some things recently about identity shifting. Have you ever heard of this concept? Basically, taking taking like if you are a certain way and you want to change, like you want to change your life, you take on this new identity. And that could be like, like you, like moving from, you know, where you were at to Colorado, changing the whole surrounding of people that you're around, changing the way you dress, changing the way you talk, changing, like making a concerted effort, which at first feels fake, well, well, this is, I was watching a video about this recently. He said, at first this feels fake, but then you get to the place where you start to really change into that person. And I am under the belief that we get to choose. This was something when I was going through my divorce, this was something that was so like ringing in my ear. I heard it on a podcast, actually. Um, the lady, really? Okay. <laughs> yeah. She said, um, she said, I write on my mirror every day or on my mirror, it's written on my mirror that I get ready in my bathroom, you choose. And she said, me and my daughter read it every day. And we say, you get to choose how you respond to certain things that happen to you in life. And I was in the middle, my husband had just left me. (laughs) So I'm in the middle of like feeling bitterness and, and resentment and anger. And I'm like, you know what, Amber, you get to choose. Like, are you gonna choose to to do that let your kids see you like be angry and bitter now it doesn't just happen overnight that's not something that I just say hey I'm not gonna be bitter anymore so I never wake up bitter it's an ongoing struggle but it's a choice I get to make every time so when the bitterness comes up or anger or resentment or any of those feelings come up I can grab them and say I'm choosing not to respond to that I might feel that way. I'm aware of it, but I'm going to choose to not do that. So I truly believe that shifting your identity and shifting, sometimes shifting your environment, which is not an overnight thing either. That takes time, you know, but um, one being aware, that's the first step. Once we can be fully aware that, hey, this is a problem. It's a problem with how I think. It's a problem with what I'm, how I'm conducting myself, or it's a problem with, you know, how I'm interacting with other people. Like, then we can start to fix it. But first, you have to know there's a problem, <laughs> you know. Right. But it breaks my heart. Oh, my God. It just breaks my heart. There's two things. One, that kids grow up in places where they are experiencing this kind, this kind of loss, violence, and death. And that is heartbreaking. And I wish I knew the solution to that. The second thing that you mentioned earlier in the conversation that also breaks my heart is that when your brother passed away, I believe you said, mm-hmm. you went to churches and asked to be, yes, for, for them to perform his service, his memorial mm-hmm. service. And they said no. And it's like, yeah. I understand that, you know, suicide is a, it's a horrible thing, but let's have a little bit of sympathy here. You know, not only you have a family who 
they didn't make that choice to, you know, for your, your, your brother made that choice. And so there, you have that one side of the coin, but then on the other side of the coin, no one knows what was going on in his head that day, that night. Is it in the middle of depression? We've all kind of been at this devastating place where it's like to judge to me is sickening, really. I think it's sickening. I agree. And I'm just like to tell someone I'm not going to allow you to do your, to, you know, to honor your son or brother or, you know, family member here at this church because of suicide. It to me is a problem. That's a problem. It is. And we, we felt bitter about that too. We, we were so bitter about that, but the show was gone. We, like I said, luckily my mother's friend, Dale is a pastor and she, she did it. She did it for us. We we had the funeral at the actual uh, funeral home that we had his wake at. So, but yeah, like I said, it was, it was just weird. Yeah. You know? We're, we're a situation, weird time, you know, I'm sorry. And it felt like a dream. You... Well, a nightmare. Yeah. I'm so sorry for what you, for the, you know, the, the different things that you've experienced. That's, that's really hard, but I'm also very grateful for the person that you are you know, the person that you are now and the, the impact that you're making through the podcast. I appreciate that. I appreciate sharing that your a lot, story. Yeah, absolutely. It, I appreciate it. It goes a long way, Patrick. You never know what, what kind of impact you're going to make, you know, just hope it's a good one. <laughs> yeah, I hope so. <laughs> I, I hope, I hope, um, the kids can see these things and learn it's okay. You know what I mean? Like it, we all deal with things, the days will get better, but you have to want to make it better. I, I refuse to sit down and just lay down. That's a fighter spirit in me. Like me being, me being a boxing martial artist, that spirit carried me. It's like, you know, I got to get back up. Yeah. And I'm not down for a second. Absolutely. I am, but I'm not down for the count. I'm not out. No, I got to get back up and keep fighting. I have to, you know, because, um, so life, it, life does get better. It does eventually. Fitness played a big integral role in your kind of rising above. Absolutely. Even as a younger, a, a younger teenager, when I when I got into, uh, well, as a younger kid, when I got into martial arts and stuff, that helped me deal with anger because I had anger growing up as well. Just you know, like just from things I've been around, whatever. Um, trying to process things, trying to like figure out who I am as a person. But uh, that definitely was that channel I needed to e- exercise who I, you know, what I feel. And um, yeah, f- fitness definitely played a pivotal part in my life especially after my mother died absolutely and after my brother too that definitely helped a lot yes it did mm-hmm. um because i started to feel better my, by myself i felt more confidence my body's looking better um I, overall i just i just felt good you know what i mean I, mm-hmm. I felt really good my spirit was 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 feeling better as well you know how it yeah. is you're a fitness yeah. person you know yeah i think it's huge being able to um uh there's, I don't know that I don't know the science behind it, but I do believe you get addicted to the uh, dopamine that happens in your brain Absolutely. when you're <laughs> when you're working out, <laughs> sweating, and getting rid of toxins and just movement. Um, I have a mm-hmm. friend who's a therapist, and she she she's big on just movement. You know, when you're feeling depressed or sick, even like just get up and move, even if it's just like dancing or you know whatever just get up and move because there is something to that and i think i think fitness is it's like nature's medicine <laughs> absolutely <laughs> so yes things. i agree <laughs> yes yes yeah. I, I was just saying like fitness to me is it, is better to do that than to be on drugs and answer the presence you know what i mean like uh fitness you just feel so much better once you lift weights or hit the bag or whatever or cardio you know you, you just take the weight off your shoulders you know you do so, yeah, absolutely. What? Fitness all the way for me. You can clear your mind, too. And so when, when I go to work out, sometimes I will be trying to think of, make a decision or try to come up with names of stuff. You know, <laughs> entrepreneur, you yeah. got to come up <laughs> with a name for something or whatever, or try to write social media posts or whatever. It comes to me in the gym. That's where, you know, my initiative for this entire project come to me in the gym under the squat rack. I was like praying about how I could get stories, impactful stories out to people. I was hearing impactful stories. I thought the world needed to hear. 
And I'm like, how can I do this? And I prayed about it, prayed about it, prayed about it. One day I got up, wasn't even thinking about it, went to the gym, got under the squat rack and it popped <laughs> in my head. Why don't you photograph transformation through trauma? <laughs> I was like, whoa. Nice. <laughs> so I, I don't know. I'm a big proponent for fitness for sure. I think it's huge. Um, so I always Absolutely. love talking to other fitness people and getting their perspective on that. Any takeaways that you want to say as far as like resources and things that you would recommend to other people who might be struggling through these things? Definitely recommend um, if if you have, let's say you work for a college or whatnot, talk to somebody. Um, if you have a job that has like counseling, talk to somebody. Okay. If you're dealing with something, talk to somebody. Like don't, don't be afraid to, uh, you know, to be real and be honest, be transparent about whatever you're dealing with, because it's better to let it out than to hold it in. And then you do something crazy, you know? <laughs> so I, I recommend that. And also uh, recommend fitness like Amber and I was talking about do fitness. Um, just take your life back, take control of your life. Don't let, don't let these things control you at all. Don't do that. I mean, I, I understand for a second, but um, j just bounce back. You see, I, I bounce back. You bounce back. Uh, plenty of people bounce back. It's not easy. Not an easy role at all. Nobody said life would be easy. We just had to navigate the best way that we can and try to, you know, do the best of our ability and just try to do right, do the right thing. That's all. Mm -hmm. And that's where growth happens. It's so crazy what they say, like when life gives you lemons, make lemonade. And it's so stupid, yes. <laughs> but it's also so true. It's like, it is. truly, if you learn how to do that, the skill of like growing through that process is huge. And you, right. once the brain learns something, it can't ever go back. So once you've overcome one thing, you're going to continue to be able to overcome more and more and more. So Absolutely. I think, I think you're right on. I, I, I love the advice you gave. Yeah, don't, don't make um permanent decision off temporary emotions. Okay. Oh, <laughs> all right. that's, that's all good. I like that. That's real that's though, one. because people do it all the time. People do it all the time. So that that's my take for that. And I want to get my social media handle. Um, my Instagram is P thriller. Okay. It's P T H R I L L A. Lowercase, all together, no space, no underscore, none of that. And my Facebook is uh, Patrick Thrasher. That's my personal page. So just give me and a shout gonna, out. Uh, we're going to okay, put that sorry, in the show ahead. notes too. We'll put all of that in your show okay. notes as well so that people can reach out, get in contact with you if, if they want to. Follow along. Go listen to your podcast. It's different than mine. It's similar in that you you talk to people about their stories and some, some of them have trauma, some of them just are sharing, but, um, you know, you might right. identify people that listen to this might identify with you even better. And my heart is just that people find their place where they can get their dose of positivity because the mind, if, if the mindset is like so it's so important to just our day-to-day -day life. And it's like, if we're around that positivity on a constant, consistent basis, then I, I think that that's, that really starts to make a difference versus being around negativity. So I think what you're doing and what I'm doing is similar in that we are trying to breed positivity into the world. And so I think it's a beautiful yes. thing. Yes, so indeed, it is. I thank you so much, Patrick, for... Well, thank sharing. you. I appreciate you. Yeah. <laughs> Spending your Sunday with me and uh, Absolutely. sharing your thoughts and even getting into some of your heartache because I know that's that's a big, big feat. But, you know, like I said, I believe it's going to make a difference. So thank you. Well, thank you very much. And I got to have you on my show, too. I got to have you on one day for sure, if you don't mind. Yeah, I, I would think you'd be to. great. Thank you for listening to Through the Trauma Podcast. If you have found value in this episode or believe in the mission behind what we are doing, please subscribe so that you never miss any future episodes. Also, be sure to check out our Transformation Project at transformationthroughtraumaproject.com, where we help inspirational stories get heard on a larger scale through multiple platforms. If you know someone who can benefit from this episode, please share it with them. Until next time.